want to start with a with a what I think is probably one of the more underrated lines in a movie ever said. And it says, "Well, we're safe now. Thank goodness we're in a bowling alley." I thought that would get more of a laugh. <laughs> I got a I don't get it and I'm going to explain it. Bowling alleys today are not real safe and when we think about it. If you've been to a bowling alley, it's kind of a, um, and if you love to bowl, I apologize if I'm offending you right now, um, but they can be kind of seedy and, and a little dark and shady and not the most comforting place to be. But, but in this movie, when it was mentioned, we're safe now, thank goodness we're in a bowling alley. It was in a time that was in the past when bowling alleys might be the safe place. It's where a family would go on a Friday night and not have to worry about the ways of the world infiltrating. It was a good place for them to go. Um, it actually comes from the 1998 film Pleasantville. And I've mentioned Pleasantville quite a bit since I've been here because, in a way, Mason is Pleasantville. Um, we, we live a little behind the times um, in a lot of ways, and that's a good thing. There's some good things that come from that. But in this movie, this 1998 movie Pleasantville, it's a story that centers on two siblings who... They wind up trapped in a 1950s TV show. They live in 1998, and somehow, through the magic of movies, they end up inside a 1950s television show, a black and white television show, set in a small Midwest town titled, called Pleasantville, where residents are seemingly perfect. Everything is okay with their life, everything is good, nothing can go wrong. It's a fantasy. It's a black and white fantasy world. The two siblings, played by Tobey Maguire and Reese Witherspoon, have lived life in the 90s, a far cry from this 1950s existence of Pleasantville. You can see on the screen the, the clothing and things like that. But over the course of the film, as the siblings' influence begins to impact others, people begin to wonder what is outside of Pleasantville. Is there more to this life? than what is being offered. What's beyond the city limits? And slowly as people experience this awakening, their lives move from black and white and into color. Their lives begin to move from a safe context to one of danger, one of excitement, one of full living. Now he continues in that quote when he says, well, we're safe for now, thank goodness we're in a bowling alley. We have to realize that he has a hard time. He is not able, the man that makes this quote, is able to move from the black and white into this new adventure. Because he continues in his quote and he says, after he says we're safe now, thank goodness we're in a bowling alley, but if George here doesn't get his dinner, any one of us could be next. It could be you, Gus, or you, Roy, or even you, Ralph. That is real rain out there, gentlemen. And he's picturing, he's, he's encapsulating this, this world that does not exist. It's a fake world that is so protected and so safe and so secure that they can hide in a bowling alley and know that when they come home, the wife is going to have cooked dinner and it's always going to be there at the same time, in the same manner, and everything is going to be perfect the way it's always been, the way they expect it to be. But as the movie progresses, those who had lived a normal, safe life begin to turn against those who are finding something new, finding something different. They begin to ridicule them. They harass them. They harm them. Riots were, were instigated, and the town soda shop was set on fire, and this world known as Pleasantville was in turmoil. People were changing. People were finding something bigger and greater than themselves. And those that could not or would not open themselves up to it revolted. Well, hit the rewind button some 2,000 years ago, and we find a similar situation. Religion is prevalent and pervasive throughout this city. It's a legalistic, ritualist, ritualistic religion. People are bound by the law, and if they followed the law, then they were living a safe life. They were living a good life, a, 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 a wholesome life. But it was one that was comfortable but mundane. 
There was no sense of adventure. There was no nothing, no looking to see what's out there. Along comes this character, this man claiming to be the Messiah, the Son of God. He teaches of a life that is different, one that is not of this world, a kingdom unlike any other. And as he teaches, his actions match his words and they're countercultural, and he upends the legalism of the law. He changes things. He challenges conventional thinking and he begins to, to stretch people in ways they never thought possible. And over time, he gains many followers because there's just something different about this man they call Jesus. Something that drew people to him, something that they gave up everything they had to follow him. Gave up careers, possessions, homes, families, reputations to follow Jesus. And so this movement begins to grow and as more and more people begin to experience the freedom that Jesus Jesus is teaching, it begins to cause dissension among the Jewish leaders. Now think about this. You're, you're a leader of your religion. You're, you're, you, you have power. You have prestige. You have status in the community. And in the time of Jesus, the, Jeru- the Jewish leaders had status in Jerusalem with the Roman Empire, with the Roman government. And so when they are starting to see this is threatening them, they begin to grumble and murmur. And they start to say things like, that's not how it's supposed to be done. That's not how we've ever done it before. And so their discontent continues to grow because they're intimidated by this man proclaiming to be Messiah, the one performing miracles and signs and wonders, wasn't doing it the way they thought it should be done. He was bringing color to a black and white world. Now some, such as Nicodemus, took a more calculated approach. And they actually went and spent time with, with Jesus to learn more about him and his teachings. They wanted to explore. They wanted to know. They wanted to see what caused people to do this. And so they spent time with him and asked him questions and learned from him. But others were so staunch in their ways, they quickly turned against him and began to seek ways to discredit him. They began to slow down the changing religious culture, trying to stop his movement. But every time they tried to trick him or catch him or trap him into violating the law, he had an answer. And here's the key. Every time he had an answer to their attacks on him, he did not sin. He did not deceive. He spoke the words from the Father and he recited the same Old Testament scripture that they have studied their whole lives. And he He turned the tables back on them. In fact, even after he entered Jerusalem, he went into the temple and actually literally turned the tables over to cleanse the temple, to show them what you are doing is not working. It is not the end of the means. This man, Jesus, was learned and educated. He was a teacher, a rabbi, prepared for the task. He spent the first three decades of his life preparing for just over three years of ministry to bring this countercultural world. And so the rage increases inside the Pharisees and they decide that the only way to end the threat was to eliminate the threat. Jesus must die. Jesus must die. But remember, these Pharisees, these Jewish leaders were bound by the law. They could not put this man to death. They could not kill him. They had to come up with another way to eliminate him. And so they were smart. They were savvy. They had political connections and they knew the political ramifications that would come from this. And they also, through those connections, knew that one of the things that the Roman Empire was most afraid of was a riot among the Jewish people. And so they went and they encountered and and approached and talked and figured out a plan. And that plan was to have one of Jesus' confidants, one of his closest friends, to betray him. To turn him over to the Roman authorities to arrest him, put him on trial, and then they crucify him. And so they did that. And their plan worked. Scripture tells, tells us that he was arrested and he was beaten, battered, broken, He was hung on the cross to die. 
And as he hung on that cross through all of that, Jesus' life continued to be countercultural, continued to be outside the norm. Because you see, Jesus did not protest, he did not resist. He had the power to remove himself from the cross, yet he willingly bore the cross. And he suffered and he died. And as he hung on that cross, he exclaimed, It is finished. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And he breathed one last breath and died. They won. The movement's over. This man is gone. The threat has been eliminated. The old way had won. They'd squashed the rebellion, and this new way of living was no more. Order was restored in Pleasantville. Or was it? Because Matthew 27, verse 51 through 54 tells us this. In the moment that Jesus took his last breath and he died and he left this earth, it says, Behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city, and many appeared, appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake, and they saw what took place, they were filled with awe, and they were filled with wonder, and they said, Truly, this is the Son of God. See, the cross is an important thing. Because Jesus had to die. And I don't want you to miss that. Jesus had to die. But when he died, we learned several things. Several things that show us who he really was. And the first thing that happens is is when Jesus breathes that last breath and he dies, the curtain, the veil is torn in two. And it's torn from top to bottom. And up until this point, in order for a person to have a relationship with God, to have communion with God, they had to go through an intermediary. They had to go through the high priest. And so the high priest is the only one that could go behind this curtain, kind of a Wizard of Oz type deal. Had to go behind this curtain and he communed and he conversed with God on behalf of the people. That was the only way. But by Jesus dying on the cross, a new way was opened up. And when the veil is torn in two, it showed that there is now no more barrier to getting to God. You can go to God. The second thing that happens there is there is a great earthquake. There's a great earthquake. And Scripture tells us in Luke 19.40, the Pharisees try to rebuke Tell, they try to tell Jesus to rebuke his disciples, and Jesus answers this. He says, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. As Jesus dies, the rocks cry out. And the rocks are crying out that the law is done. Death has been defeated because the Messiah has come and fulfilled his purpose. The rocks are crying out. And think about as our world begins to go further and further away from God, we hear more and more about earthquakes all around the world. Are the rocks crying out? The third thing, and this is something that just really resonated with me this week, and I don't know why. Dead people rose from the dead. It wasn't just Jesus in that moment says there were many resurrections. The tombs opened up, and then they revealed themselves to people in Jerusalem after Jesus had revealed himself. So they had, be, had risen from the dead, people who had died. The saints, those that were fo- faithful followers, rose from the dead. Jesus is the first fruit, so after he made himself known to those on the third day, those that ris- rose from the dead then made themselves known to their loved ones to show that death has been overcome. Isn't that amazing? Like that just spoke volumes to me this week. That it wasn't just, yes, Jesus rose from the dead. 
And he defeated death in that. And, and as an example of that, many, many people, many saints who had gone before him in death rose from the dead again to show that. And then the fourth thing that happens here is the centurion professes who Jesus was. It says they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the son of God. And what this says is that Jesus is for everyone because the centurion was not a Jew. He was Roman. And many, many years before Peter goes and opens the gospel to the Gentiles in the book of Acts, a centurion, Roman centurion, at the death of Jesus, says this was the son of God and professes faith in him right there. Jesus is for everyone. Because you see, the resurrection... is the single greatest event in history. Now, after Jesus died, all of this that was going to happen was not known right away. I love being on the backside of history because I don't want to have to oftentimes know what's on the other side. I don't want to go through it to become part of history. I want to know what already happened. And 2,000 years later, we can look at what happened in the, in the year, days, weeks, months, and years to follow immediately after, after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and see the great things that were accomplished and be encouraged by that and just be like ready to run through a wall for Jesus. But these people, when Jesus is taken and buried in a tomb, his followers are grieving. They're grieving the loss of a loved one the loss of a movement, a hope, their new life. Three days later, the women head to the tomb. And they're going to the tomb with perfumes for the purpose of preparing Jesus' body for his final burial. They're hoping to finish preparing him so that they can say their last goodbyes and close the tomb and move on with their lives. Sad, lost, hopeless, But these women get to the tomb, and when they get there, they see an angel who bright, white uh, clothing telling them, the man that you seek is not here. He's risen. The scripture tells us that there was an earthquake, and an angel came down and rolled the stone away. And in that moment, the guards, the Roman guards, fell fell to the ground like they were dead. And these women hear this message, and they are just totally blown away the angel gives him the message and says now go quickly run run to your people run to the disciples the other followers of Jesus and tell them what you have seen and they do and I can just imagine they're like tripping over each other like who's going to be the first one to tell them how can I take a shortcut to get there so I can win the race They're just running as fast as they can. And along the way, as they're going along the way, guess who shows up? Jesus. Jesus shows up and he speaks to them. And he says that death has been defeated and I am alive. And they fall at his feet and worship him. The resurrection is the single greatest event in history. Because without the resurrection... Nothing else matters. Nothing that happened before it, nothing that happened in those days, and nothing that happens now or in the future matters because of the resurrection. Because the resurrection does this. The resurrection proves that Jesus is God's son. John 10, 17 through 18 tells us that that when he raises from the dead, it is proof that God's will is being carried out. It verifies that scripture is truth. Because Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection was prophesied all throughout the Old Testament scriptures. And now it's happened. So something that was prophesied and promised has come true. So scripture is truth. It assures us of our future resurrections. It assures us of our future resurrections. As, As Jesus died and then he rose again and then we see others who were saints that rose again and they they make themselves appear 1 Thessalonians tells us that we too will have resurrected bodies if we place our faith in Jesus Christ. Acts 17.31 tells us that the, the 
the resurrection is a proof of a future judgment because he has now cleansed us of our sins and now he is going forward for us and there will be a future judgment for those that believe in him and those that do not. Hebrews 7.23 tells us that it is the basis for his heavenly priesthood, for his anointing, his divinity, his rising to his purpose and place in this world. Romans 6.4 tells us that the resurrection gives us power for Christian living. 1 Peter 3.5 says it assures our future inheritance. And this is where I want to land for just a few minutes today is that the resurrection paves the way for what we find in Roman in Revelation chapter 21. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them as they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Re- Revelation 21.4, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be, n- be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And this is a great promise about Jesus right here in verse 5. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. The resurrection promises us true Pleasantville. If, as Romans 10, 9 says, if you believe in your heart, Jesus died on the cross for your sins and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. If you do that, what we see in Revelation 21 is a promise to be given to you because of the resurrection. A future hope, a new heaven, a new earth where there will be no more pain, no more suffering. And people like to envision what this is like, but if you read the scriptures, it says that it is a resurrected earth. It's the earth that we know perfect. It's you perfect. Living with God. Nothing separating us from him for eternity. Towards the end of the movie, The siblings have a choice. They can go back to their life in 1998, one of excitement, danger, full of color, chasing the unknown. Or they could stay in Pleasantville, where it is safe and secure in what they now know. We have that choice. We have that choice. We have that choice to stay in Pleasantville. If our life is good and we don't have Jesus, then why do we need Jesus? For some of us, our life is good. We know Jesus and we're not living for Jesus. We've said that we believe that he is our Lord and Savior, but we don't live like he is our Lord and Savior. Because when we live like he is our Lord and Savior, we live outside of Pleasantville. We are no longer following a religious life that is slave to the past. We're no longer chained to the ways of what church is and the Christian life are. We are living a life of abundance. Because the life that stays in Pleasantville is a life that wants to live tucked away in our little Christian bubbles 
following the rules, not making any noise, living in a 1950s bowling alley world. But Jesus is calling us to so much more. There's another way, and he announced it in a big, big way. So big that the rocks cried out. The Pharisees went around telling people as they were trying to crush this rebellion, saying, this is not the way we've ever done it. This is how we've always done, we've always done it this way, not the way he's saying. How could you change on us? And Jesus walked in and he said, Behold, I make all things new. And you want me to show you? Okay. The world has never had a perfect sinless Savior that died on a cruel cross for the forgiveness of your sins. But now it has. And he did that for you. He did that for me. And for everyone on this earth. If you put your faith, faith in him, if you believe with your heart, and profess with your mouth, you will be saved. Jesus said, I'm going to change everything. I'm going to change the world with one singular act. I'm going to go to the cross. And I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die. And then I'm going to raise again. And 2,000 years from now, there's going to be a group of people in Mason, Texas that are celebrating that. As they celebrate all across the world because they know that I win. God wins in the end and God has the ability in, Roman, in Revelation 21 to bring a new heaven and a new earth. Do we get caught looking in the past hoping to reclaim the safety of what is known or do we find ourselves looking to the future, the coming of the new heaven and the new earth? filled with hope that causes us to shout from the mountaintops that Jesus is alive. That's the life I want to live. The one that's full of color, the one that's full of adventure, the one that takes risks because I'm following Jesus in everything that I do. Is that where you're at? I want to close with this thought. A friend of mine recently said this. He said, rearview mirrors are for glances only. When Jesus says in Revelation 21, 5, behold, I make all things new. And scripture tells us that when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. That is Jesus doing a work in you, which means, yes, we can glance back at what we once were, but now we can look forward at what we're going to become. Because Jesus changes everything. We celebrate Easter and we look back at what Christ has done for us so that we can look forward to the future glory living in communion with God in a new heaven and a new earth. True Pleasantville, the resurrection promises us that if we put our faith and hope in him.